giving the weapon a much greater range and accuracy than the smooth bore musket. But because it was designed as a civilian hunting weapon, the rifle did not accept the bayonet. The success of Morgan's troops in the battles of Saratoga was mainly due to the fact that Morgan commanded not only a corps of select riflemen, but also a battalion of light infantry under Henry Dearborn. This light infantry was equipped with muskets and bayonets, and every time that the riflemen got themselves in trouble, which was very frequently, um, they could run behind this line of Dearborn's battalion of light infantry and get themselves saved from being driven off the field. Both armies seemed determined to conquer or die, one continual blaze without any intermission till dark, when by consent of both parties, it ceased. General John Glover. The first battle of Freeman's Farm cost Burgoyne 600 men. The rebel army lost half as many. British Lieutenant Thomas Anbury helped bury the bodies of his comrades. No other distinction is paid to officer or soldier than that the officers are put in a hole by themselves. Our army abounded with young officers, and in the course of his unpleasant duty, three of the 20th Regiment were interred together, the age of the eldest not exceeding 17. Lieutenant Thomas Anbury. Now Burgoyne waited, hanging his hopes on a further correspondence he had just received from Henry Clinton. If you think 2,000 men can assist you effectually, I will make a push at Fort Montgomery in about 10 days. I expect reinforcements every day. Sir Henry Clinton, letter of September 12th. Burgoyne's Indian allies and many of his German mercenaries were deserting him. Supplies were short. Food was scarce. His men were sick. At no time did the Jews await the coming of the Messiah with greater expectancy than we evaded the coming of General Clinton, a German soldier at Freeman's farm. Gates tried to anticipate Burgoyne's next move. Perhaps his despair may dictate to him to risk all upon one throw. He is an old gamester and in his time has seen many chances. General Horatio Gates. Burgoyne struck on October 7th. Again, his men were met by Morgan's sharpshooters. Gates had refused to give Benedict Arnold command of troops. Like so many others, he disliked Arnold's abrasive style and distrusted him. No man shall keep me in my tent today. If I am without command, I will fight in the ranks. But the soldiers, God bless them, will follow my lead. Benedict Arnold. Arnold defied Gates, his commanding officer, and joined the second battle of Freeman's Farm. The talented field general quickly identified Burgoyne's key strategic position, the Bremen Redoubt. Without an actual command, he rides out onto the field of battle, takes command of troops that are attacking the Bremen Redoubt, and ultimately captures that particular redoubt. Arnold was a brilliant tactical commander, uh, and his subsequent treason uh, doesn't necessarily negate that. A musket ball smashed Arnold's thigh, but not before he had turned the battle for the Americans. Benedict Arnold is one of the great enigmas in American history. If he had been killed in 1777, the Battle of Saratoga, when he penetrated the British lines, if that musket ball that had shattered his thigh, if that had gone into his heart instead, he would be remembered today as one of the greatest heroes in the pantheon of American heroes. General Johnny Burgoyne exposed himself to enemy fire throughout the battle rallying his men. Bullets or musket balls tore his hat and uniform, but he was never hit. However, Simon Fraser, one of his fellow generals, fell to the accuracy of a Morgan rifleman, Timothy Murphy. General Fraser, 
was the British general who was covering uh, General Burgoyne's retreat. And in the process of doing this, he exposed himself personally to the riflemen. And at 300 yards, Timothy Murphy was given the credit for mortally wounding General Fraser. They brought Fraser to the house where Frederica von Riedesall was waiting out the battle. She had expected to dine with him that evening. About three o'clock in the afternoon, they brought to me upon a litter of poor General Fraser. Our dining table, which was already spread, was taken away, and in its place they fixed up a bed for the general. The ball had gone through his bowels. I heard him often amidst his groans exclaim, Oh, fatal ambition, poor General Burgoyne, my poor wife. Madame Federica von Riedesall. Fraser died the next morning at 8 o'clock. He was one of 600 men from Burgoyne's army who had been killed, wounded, or were missing during the second battle of Freeman's Farm. That night, Burgoyne began his retreat. For the next several days, the Americans hounded his limping army. Then, it was over. Our retreat had been cut off. A cessation of hostilities took place, and my husband, who was thoroughly worn out, was able for the first time in a long while to lie down upon a bed. Madame Frederica von Riedesall. Burgoyne surrendered his sword and his army to Gates on October 17th, 1777. When the two men met, General Johnny said, the fortune of war, General Gates, has made me your prisoner. Then they and the other principal officers retired to Gates' tent to dine on meats and New England rum. General Benedict Arnold was absent, recuperating from his leg wound. The next time he would see battle, he would be on the side of the British. You'd have to say that Saratoga was Arnold's high watermark. It was the culmination of three years of effort on his part, constantly exposing himself in battle, of courageous efforts uh, from his march up to Kennebec, the seizure of Ticonderoga, his fighting, uh, his work on Champlain, uh, all of that, uh, it culminated in his final take charge effort that sealed the defeat of Burgoyne and led to Burgoyne's surrender, which led to the French coming in the war, which inevitably led to the eventual British defeat. For the revolutionary generation, the journey towards independence was a long one, measured in years, not months. After Saratoga, more than enough time remained for Benedict Arnold to plan the most famous treason in American history, and thus to fall from celebrated heroism to despised villainy. <laughs>